All right, so uh, let's talk about the um, chapter 10. So for chapter 10, this basically determines, uh, is, is asking you to um, provide treatments now for your patient. Your patient will either be having adequate breathing or inadequate breathing. Those are your two biggest things on here, right? So I'm going to pull up this Excel spreadsheet. Hopefully you all can see it. And again, for this, if you did are on the phone, uh, I'll make sure that I send you guys this one as well, right? So I'm going to do a share screen, uh, Microsoft Excel. All right. Can you guys see the Excel spreadsheet? You guys can see it clear, everybody? Cool, All right, so as you guys can see, I have a um, adequate breathing, right? I have this part right here, adequate breathing, and then we have inadequate breathing. Under adequate breathing, we have normal, okay? Those are your normal breathing, and then somebody who's in respiratory distress, okay? And then in adequate breathing, we have somebody who's in respiratory failure, and somebody who's in respiratory arrest. So let's talk about what's normal breathing first, because it's easy to, if somebody is, has a normal breathing, if you need to know that what's normal first in or before you start finding out what is abnormal, right? So what are normal breathing? Well, normal breathing is basically, for example, for your adults, right? For your adults, the range of your adult breathing is about what, 12 to 20, right? And then for a child, uh, it's going to be, 15 to 30, okay, that's for your child. And then for infants, these are gonna, this is gonna be about 25 to 50, right? 25 to 50. So anything that is within these ranges right here, these are all gonna be considered normal rates, okay? And um, that means that they do have adequate breathing. Another thing that we can consider is, are these individuals. Uh, we have a thing called pulse oximetry, right, or pulse ox. You're going to hear this as pulse ox. This is basically when we're measuring how much oxygen is in the blood. So anybody who has a 95% oxygen saturation in their blood or above, 95% and above, will be considered something having uh, adequate breathing, right? So all this right here, oops, rep text, there you go. Right, so all these right here will be considered adequate breathing because they're all within the normal range. Okay, so now let's talk about somebody who's in respiratory distress. Well, how will I know if somebody's in respiratory distress? Well, just like I was telling everybody in Bravo earlier, well, this is very common because you do this three times a week in this, like in your dorms and barracks early in the morning, right? When you go PT, um, you tend to have that respiratory distress because the signs of respiratory distress everything is increasing, right? Everything is increasing. So increase of what? Increase of respiratory rate, okay? Respiratory rate. Um, what else is increasing on this one? Besides the respiratory rate, we also have increase of um, heart rate, right? So your pulse tends to increase. Um, anxiety is also starting to kick in, increasing anxiety, okay? And then you also have an increase in the... Um, uh, it could, this can also lead to what we call a severe respiratory, uh, severe respiratory distress. And I'll talk about that here sh shortly. Okay. So if you're thinking of, um, what do you call this? Uh, if you're thinking of respiratory distress, just think of everything is increasing, but I can still breathe on my own. Okay. I'm still able to support my breathing. I'm still able to support my own lungs. My body's just trying to compensate for now. So that's basically the respiratory distress. Okay. So adequate breathing, normal, and respiratory distress. Now let's talk about inadequate breathing, this specific section right here. So let's first talk about respiratory failure. So what would be considered respiratory failure? Well, first of all, anything that is considered abnormal, I can spell, abnormal respiratory rate, okay? So anything within an abnormal respiratory rate, respiratory rate, so what is considered abnormal respiratory rate? Well, anything that is below 8 possibly or above 28. So below 8, that's very, very slow for somebody who is an adult specifically. And a breathing of above 28, that is very, very fast. Like your, your, body, your, your body's not able to um, have mm -hmm. a proper gas exchange um, when it comes to this. Please mute your microphones. Thanks. Okay, All right, so that's considered abnormal respiratory rate above, uh, below eight and above 28, okay? 
Another thing that you're going to find in respiratory failure, you're going to start to see cyanosis, okay? Because since the body's not getting enough oxygen, what are you going to see eventually? Well, you're going to see, eventually, you're going to see blue turning, the patient's somewhat turning blue because there's inadequate perfusion, okay? So you're going to see that one with your patients, okay? So earlier, I mentioned something about what we call severe respiratory distress. Well, HM1, what's the difference between that? So if you don't mind moving to a specific page in the book, okay, or there's this like, um, color-coded thing. I believe that's page 222 in your book. Okay. Yes. Someone has a question about it being 26 and if it's a big difference with the numbers. Um, we're, we keep saying, um, thank you for reading that out because I don't see the chat box when I'm doing share screen. Um, the question is, 26 and 28. Well, standard is we go by with 28 because that is what National Registry has been implementing. That's what we want you guys to be embed in the head. Um, sure, some books say above 26, but we're going to go with above 28. Is that, is that clear for everyone? We're going to go with above 28, okay? Yes, and what page did you say that you were on? Uh, page 222. I want you guys to look at something real quick for me on page 222. Okay. If you look at the green zone, okay, if you look at the green zone, there's two types of respiratory distress there, increasing respiratory distress and severe respiratory distress. So if you look at the old man underneath the increasing respiratory distress, he's still in adequate breathing. You know why? Because... He only has uh, invi a visibly short breath. He's speaking three to four, sen four word sentences, and he has increasing anxiety. So typical signs, symptoms of respiratory distress. That means my body can still compensate. But look at right underneath increasing respiratory distress on page 222. Now it's called severe respiratory distress. Now the patient is speaking one to two word sentences, they're very diaphoretic and severe anxiety. Well, HM1, why don't we not just call this respiratory failure? Well, the reason why we don't want to call this respiratory failure exactly because, well, that's just EMT itself. It's, it's full of gray areas. So you actually have to know where exactly your patient is at in this line. So respiratory distress and respiratory failure has that very thin line. And that severe respiratory distress is one of those thin lines. So if, if you're given a scenario, well, look at the description of the patient. If the patient is able to speak to you in full, complete sentences, I can't breathe. I'm having a hard time breathing. That's respiratory distress. But if they're saying, I can't, okay, there's like long pauses and it's one to two word sentences. That's severe respiratory distress. That's a sign that, yeah, my patient can still talk to me, but they're, they can't, they're not able to support their breathing way too good, right? So that's why they fall underneath that inadequate breathing. Does that make sense, everyone? Okay. Each have one quick question for you. Are we going with the 28 or the 26 for the test tomorrow? Uh, we're going with the 28, okay? And if um, anytime there is an error on that one, we usually give you back the points because we do not, some, some of these things, we want to make sure that it matches with the national registry. So, and that specific one right there, the 28 concept, I want to make sure that you guys know about this, right? Below eight and above 28. That's why I, I wrote it down here. Make sense? Right. Thank you. Yep. Right. Right, next, um, respiratory, uh, so everybody clear with normal and respiratory distress and respiratory failure, right? Okay, so now let's talk about uh, respiratory arrest. Well, respiratory arrest is pretty easy. This is basically apnea or ap, basically a patient not breathing at all, so zero breathing, nothing, zero breathing, or the patient can be breathing, but it's not actual true breathing. And what do we call that? We call that agonal gasping, right? So agonal gasping is basically a term for somebody, you think they are breathing, but they're really not. So those are the ones that, right? That they're trying to like take in that air. That's considered agonal gasping, right? So don't just think that, oh, complete your breathing, no chest rise, no feeling of air. Well, there's a type of breathing that falls under respiratory arrest where a lot of students get confused, and that's called agonal gasping, okay? 
right? So that's this specific table right here. I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to look at it um, because this table will basically help you determine what treatment am I going to provide my patient, okay? So, and while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and cover what treatments you're going to give. So for adequate breathing, since my patient is still breathing fine, yes. Sorry, the 95% that goes under the inadequate? Uh, this is the 95% and above. This falls under the adequate, okay? The inadequate breathing is anything below 95%. So if I have a 94%, 93%, 92%, that would mm -hmm. fall underneath the inadequate breathing. But if, if the pulse ox or the SpO2, some people call it the SpO2, is 95 and above, then they're adequate. So if they're like 94, 93, 92, 91, then they're going to be considered inadequate. Does that answer your question, Williams? Understood. Okay, cool. All right. So for adequate breathing, this one right here, my patient can still breathe fine, but they're subbing, um, somewhat having trouble breathing in some um, aspects, so I'm going to provide them with oxygenation. And how do I do that? I only do it in two things, non-rebreather mask, at 15 liters per minute and a nasal cannula, 46 liters per minute, right? So those are your two things that you're gonna provide for somebody who is in respiratory distress, okay? So in, including increasing respiratory distress. For somebody who has inadequate breathing, this side of the table, right? These individuals are the ones that cannot breathe on their own and I have to breathe for them. So these are the ones that are going to be providing ventilation. And what are the ventilation mechanisms that we have? Well, we have the ones for respiratory failure specifically. I'm going to be providing assisted ventilation. Why do I call it assisted ventilation? Because they're still somewhat breathing. I just need to assist them with it. Right. So, this, for example, that guy that has severe respiratory distress, he's still somewhat breathing, but I need to assist them. So they're still somewhat conscious. Right. So that's called assisted ventilation. Respiratory arrest would be the ones on the artificial ventilation. That means I'm acting as their lungs. I'm going to have to be their lungs for them. This is why we, this is an example of this is the BVM of an apneic patient, right? Your patient is apneic, so you're breathing for them using the bag valve mask. So what devices am I going to use with these two right here? Well, I can use the pocket face mask, which we're going to talk about here shortly, um, the bag valve mask, um, the FROP VD, Okay, the flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation device, right? So those are your, or the CPAP as well. You can utilize the CPAP for inadequate breathing if you can, or if it's advised, okay? So those are your main ones right there. Any questions with that one, class? Because I'm about to stop the share screen on here. Any questions with this specific table? I'm going to stop the share screen so I can see the chat, chat box real quick. Uh, let's see, two, 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 two. all right, so it looks like there's no. Um, the chart that Mr. Andy showed and the one that I showed are very, very similar. So um, it's basically a summary of just of chapter 10. Um, so it's just basically a quick overview of what it looks like. So. Can you give a good description of ventilation and respiration and how they differ? Yes. So ventilation is the ventilation is just basically me taking in air and exhaling air. That's ventilation, the movement of gas to and from the lungs. Respiration is the exchange of gases on a cellular level in the bloodstream, right? So that's those are your two. Um, that's the two main difference on it. So ventilation, if you think about it, ventilation, I can see it because I'm, the chest is rising and falling. Respiration happens on a cellular level. Does that make sense? Does that somewhat clear up that one? Okay, very good. Right, so you guys, so like I said, I always want to start with that table because it gives an overview because in the book, if we, if we go follow the book per, um, per, uh, uh, page by page, it's spread out all over. So that table helps summarize everything, okay? Right, so now let's go over um, chapter 10, page by page, okay? So let's start with page 216. 
Um, 216, um, I already talked about ventilation. It's just basically moving in and out inhalation and exhalation. We also have alveolar ventilation. Alveolar ventilation is the amount of air that actually actually reaches, okay, actually reaches the alveoli. Because remember, not everything goes into the alveoli, right? So there's two formulas that I want you guys to know. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna pull up my screen again. I'm gonna do a share screen. I want you to remember two formulas for me, okay? How to calculate, okay, I'm gonna zoom in here shortly, right? I'm gonna do a share screen. Share screen, Microsoft Excel. Right, so there's two, um, two formulas. First formula is for the minute volume. The way I calculate minute volume is the tidal volume times the respiration rate. Okay, so tidal volume is the amount of air, right? That's the amount of air that I take in in one cycle. And the respiration rate is the how fast am I breathing? So you multiply those two, you get the minute volume. But another important concept right here is the alveolar ventilation. And I'm going to label that as AV. So like I said, this is an important formula. You're going to see this test. You're going to see this NREMT-wise. Okay, so alveolar ventilation. How do we calculate alveolar ventilation? Well, for the alveolar ventilation, first, you're going to try to calculate the tidal volume, okay? And then you're going to subtract the dead air space. And I labeled that as the DAS, right? So tidal volume minus the dead air space. That will basically give me how much um, air doesn't reach into the lungs, right? T TV, tidal volume minus the dead air space, okay? And then after you get that, you're going to multiply that. Okay, by the respiration rate. So alveolar ventilation equals tidal volume minus dead air space times respiration rate. Okay, so an example of this one is on page 217. Let's look at somebody who has an asthma attack, right? On, on that upper paragraph right there. So somebody who has an asthma attack, right? If you look at their tidal volume, it's 300 ml times 16. They only get 4,800 ml. That's their minute volume. Right? Then if you, look at their, um, if you look at the alveolar ventilation, you get 300, which is their tidal volume, minus 150, which is the average dead air space, times 16, which is the respiration rate, and you get a total of 2,400. Right? So those are your two formulas that I want you to know specifically for calculating. Okay? Any questions? Not one, but okay. um, for those of you that are like biting pizzas or whatever, shut your mouth and mute your mics. <laughs> yeah, that's you guys, and you're interrupting my lecture. All right. Any questions with that one? All right, let's move on. All right, physiology of respiration. Okay, you have terms here that we already talked about. Um, diffusion is the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's how gas exchange happens within your alveoli, right? And then we have two types of respiration. Like I said, respiration is more of a exchange of gas from the cells in the bloodstream. So the pulmonary respiration, if you look at the definition, is the exchange of the gases between the alveoli and the blood, okay? So in the pulmonary cap capillaries, that's why it's called pulmonary re respiration. Cellular respiration is between the cells and the blood, okay? So that's the main difference between pulmonary respiration and cellular, cellular respiration, okay? Then we have the pathophysiology of cardiopulmonary system. So what are the things that can interrupt the breathing? Well, first off, we have the mechanics of breathing disrupted on page 217, somebody who gets stabbed in the chest. What happens if somebody gets stabbed in the chest? Well, if you guys remember from mod one, we have positive, vent, uh, positive pressure and negative pressure. When somebody gets stabbed in the chest, the negative pressure basically disappears, right? So when the negative pressure disappears, the diaphragm is not going to be able to pull, uh, pull in air, okay? And then it could also be because of a loss of nervous control, so a damage to the spine, right? So for example, the cervical spine, there's a lot of nerves there that controls your respiration. So if that's damaged, you're not going to be able to breathe properly. This is why we, don't, we want to make sure we always protect the spine, okay? Um, if the patient sustains a painful chest wall injury and basically a blunt force trauma, such as an airbag deploying on the patient's chest, 
or the patient has an airway problem such as bronchoconstriction, so somebody who has an asthma attack. So those are the mechanical dis um, breathing disruptions, okay? Then we also have gas exchange interruption. So individuals that have low levels of oxygen, so individuals that are in a confined space, or so for example, mine workers, they're very, um, they're deprived of oxygen because they're all the way deep down inside those mines and there's a low concentration of oxygen. So gas exchange can be interrupted in that one. Um, diffusion problems, individuals with COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, can, uh, can basically um, cause the alveoli to not exchange gas properly. So that's gonna cause them to have gas interruption, okay? And then the last pathophysiology problem is the circulation issues. So if there's not enough blood, obviously not enough blood means there's not enough oxygen. So not enough oxygen means that the blood body's not gonna survive and it's gonna cost you to go into hypoperfusion. And then you have hemoglobin problems. So hemoglobin problems, hemoglobin is very important because it's the one that carries oxygen, right? That's in the blood. So for example, somebody who has anemia, um, they have low amounts of hemoglobin. So what does that mean? That means low amounts of cells that carries oxygen that the cells will need, right? So those are your pathophysiological problems when it comes to the cardiopulmonary system, right? Are there any questions about those things, class? Everybody good? Those in this phones, chat, everybody clear, right? Okay, safe to move on? Thumbs up? Okay. Right, let's move on. Um, let's talk about the respiration. So like I said, respiration, the difference between this is it happens in either a pulmonary or a cellular level, so we don't actually see this. So that's the actual exchange of gas and carbon dioxide. That's your respiration. Um, we already talked about adequate and inadequate breathing. Um, so your adequate breathing, somebody who is still having enough oxygen in their body and their body's still able to compensate. So respiratory distress, okay, so this is for somebody who is still compensating, but they're somewhat having a hard time breathing, right? So shortness of breath, like I said, things start to go up when it comes to respiratory distress. They become an increase in anxiety, increase in heart rate, increase in respiration rate. Right? So that's for your respiratory distress. Um, when that doesn't get controlled, it moves on to respiratory failure. So respiratory failure, this is when your body is getting tired of compensating for itself. So it's slowly kind of decreasing, right? So breathing might slow down, right? Or the oxygen exchange might kind of become a lot more poor. So that's why it's going to respiratory failure. This is when you start hearing... Um, crowing, strider, right? This is when the skin starts to become a little bit more bluish. Um, this is when the oxygen saturation is now below 95, so 94%, 93. Okay, your patient's becoming more hypoxic. Um, for children, uh, this is where you see retractions and nasal flaring. Okay, so that's your respiratory failure. The respiratory arrest, this is when breathing completely stops. We call this apnea, right? apnea or another one um, that's agonal gasping patient it looks like sounds like they're breathing but they're actually not breathing so I call agonal gasping is like fake breathing okay so that being the air patients actually not getting enough air on that one okay so page 222 my favorite page in this chapter because it gives me a visual representation of what I need to give to my patients right so patient is still um, talking to me alert calm that means they're breathing fine once increased respiratory distress starts, three to four word sentences, anxiety kicks in, then that's when I either give a non rebreather mask or a nasal cannula at 15 liters per minute, high, um, con high O2 concentration. When severe respiratory distress kicks in, okay, or when res once respiratory failures kicks in, I'm gonna provide assisted ventilation. And you have on the right-hand side of that specific page what types of ventilation devices you're gonna provide. And then you have Finally, respiratory arrest, when the patient stops breathing and you're gonna provide artificial ventilation, okay? So any questions with that specific chart right there and the difference between um, respiratory distress, failure, and arrest? So when you guys are reading the scenarios for your tests, please identify, if, is my patient in distress, failure, and arrest? Because once you have it in your head, where they're at, it's easier to treat them, I promise you, okay? 
Um, this is not like mod one where it's just like a bunch of definitions, right? Do not think, especially for those of you, oh, I got a 94 and I barely studied. If you barely studied for mod two, you're, you're in for a rude awakening. Okay, you're in for a rude awakening tomorrow. So hopefully you guys are listening and taking good notes for this one. Okay? All right, so let's move on. Page 224. <clears throat> um, we already talked about the rates, right? Adult, 12 to 20 per minute. Child, 15 to 30 per minute. And infant is 25 to 50 per minute. Okay? And we already talked about from Chapter 9, what are the signs of adequate and inadequate breathing, right? So I'm not going to go over that again. But just remember, for children, it's specifically retractions and nasal flaring. That's the ones that you want to take note of when it comes to your pediatric um, patients. And then the low oxygen saturation, your SpO2, uh, below 95%. Always keep showing up because the, that's the one basically for those of you that um, – went to sick call recently, that's the one that they put on your finger, right? It's measuring the oxygen um, uh, levels in your blood, okay? Right. So any questions about that class? Right. So let's move on to page 225, hypoxia. Hypoxia is basically low amounts of oxygen in the blood. Pretty easy, right? So how would somebody get hypoxia? Obviously, if they're trapped into a low amounts of uh, an environment where there's low amounts of oxygen. So it's such as a, a patient is trapped in a fire. Patient has emphysema. What's emphysema? Well, emphysema causes your alveoli to have that mucus, mu a lot of mucus and blockage. So oxygen dif and diffusion will be able to take place, right? Or a patient that has a heart attack. If a patient has a heart attack, muscle tissues die on the, on the heart, and it's not going to be able to pump blood. Well, what's in the blood? Oxygen. So if blood's not being pumped, if the blood's not being pumped up properly by the heart, then oxygen's not going to be properly delivered. And it's going to cause your patient to have hypoxia. Right? So that's for your that's the quick um, explanation for that specific page right there on hypoxia. Right? We're now going to move on to the um, positive pressure ventilation. Any questions with that one, class? Everybody good? Cool. Y'all are munching on a lot of, y'all are fat asses. Those of you that are eating junk food right now, y'all are fat asses. That's why you're going to be fat when you're 30. Nobody's going to want you. You're going to be alone. Hashtag forever alone. Anyway, sorry, positive pressure ventilation. Um, we, um, positive pressure ventilation is basically your breathing for your patient, right? Positive pressure ventilation is basically forcing air into your patient's lungs. Okay. Here's my question for everybody. If my patient is breathing, an adult patient is breathing six breaths per minute, do you think a non-rebreather mask would do anything for your patient at all? Yes or no? Would it do anything? No. No. Thanks. You didn't have to yell. But no, it's not going to do anything. You know why? Because the non-rebreather, it's just blowing oxygen into their nose. It's not being forced into their lungs, right? So that's why this is where artificial ventilation kicks in, also known as positive pressure ventilation. So let's go over page 226 real quick. There's three um, side effects when it comes to positive pressure ventilation, but this shouldn't stop you from giving it. First one is it causes a drop in blood pressure. When you're giving a lot of positive pressure, negative pressure goes down. Well, so what if negative pressure goes down HM1? Well, negative pressure is not only responsible for pulling air in, it's also responsible for the refilling of blood in your left ventricle. So just imagine if that goes, if that's pretty low in your body, that means there's not a lot of blood that's actually being filled into your left ventricle, so causing your blood pressure to drop significantly, right? Then gastric distension. That's also, for those of you that, you know, for, that exaggerate on your squeezing, if you squeeze so hard, that air can go into the stomach, and that's going to be that's gonna called gastric distension. But you can avoid that on, your, on page 226 underneath the gastric distension. It says right there, gastric distension can be minimized by using, one, airway adjuncts. Okay, you can, you can you, uh, minimize that by using airway adjuncts, and two, proper head positioning. Okay, this is why we're so adamant about, hey, you're not doing head tilt chin lift properly. Hey, you're not doing that cross finger properly. Because if you don't do that properly, your patients, that air can go into the stomach instead of going into the lungs, right? And last but not least, hyperventilation. 
Okay, this is why you have to count. That's why we're so adamant about, hey, count one, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, four, one thousand, five, one thousand, squeeze, right? You don't want to like squeeze, 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 because that's going to cause you to have hyperventilation on your patients, right? So those are the side effects of positive pressure ventilation, but that doesn't mean that you should not do it at all, okay? <clears throat> right, any questions with that class? Right, so let's move on with the techniques for artificial ventilation, okay? So for the techniques of artificial ventilation, if we look at on page 226, those bullets right there, that's the order of precedence that you wanna do it in, okay? So as you can see, mouth to mask is the first priority. You know why that's the first thing? Because it's easily accessible as an EMT. All I gotta do is get that mask, shove it on their face, and I can give perfect seal using my two hands, right? And I, all I got to do is blow on that mask. That's why it's preferred. Second preferred method is the two rescuer BVM or the two rescuer bag valve mask. Why is that? Because one's providing a seal and one's squeezing. That's why two rescuer BVM is preferred. Then you have the flow restricted oxygen powered device. The flow restricted oxygen powered device is third in line because it is somewhat complex, right? It's somewhat complicated to operate it right? You have to like press a button, you have to do all these things. But however, it still provides um, high concentration oxygen compared to the BVM and the mouth to mask. So that's why it's number three on the preferred list. And last but not the least, the number fourth preferred list is the one rescuer BVM. This is what y'all did in the lab today, right? And some of you struggled on that seal. That's why it's the last on the line because seal is the number one issue with a one rescuer BVM. I'm going to say that again. SEAL is the number one issue when it comes to the one rescuer BVM, okay? What was the third again? Sure. The third one is the FROP VD, your flow-restricted oxygen-powered ventilation device. Okay, so let me go through that again. First one, mouth to mask. Second is two rescuer bag valve mask. Third is the flow-restricted oxygen-powered device. And the fourth one is one rescuer bag valve mask, okay? So anytime you ventilate a patient, and this is, a, uh, this is the answer to the last question of your lab, how do you know you're providing adequate ventilations to your patients? What's the answer? There you go, everybody's doing this, right? You guys are like doing like some dance moves. They're good. Equal rise and fall of the chest. That's basically how you know. It's not the equal rise and falls of the stomach, it's the equal rise and fall of the chest. And if you look at 226, when you're giving ventilation, 10 to 12 breaths per minute for adults, and then 20 breaths per minute for children and for infants, okay? So those are your rates for that one, okay? And then you also have um, another method that you can utilize is CPAP and BiPAP. So page 227, CPAP and BiPAP, it's a new effective pre-hospital modality of therapy. So it's a new thing, right? that slowly got introduced to EMTs. Before, this was only in hospitals, and we gave it to patients that have sleep apnea. But now, we're slowly using it, and we're slowly seeing it in EMT settings. This is why it says it's brand new, and it's a very effective pre-hospital modality. It's non-invasive. That means we don't have to stick tubes down somebody's throat. Positive pressure ventilation. So CPAP and BiPAP. So, um, if you don't know what it looks like, I um, highly recommend looking up pictures of the CPAP machine. I believe there's one here in this specific chapter, but look up those things of what a CPAP will look like. But it's very common for those individuals that have sleep apnea because the reason why they, they need a CPAP because when I'm sleeping, my tongue can partially block my airway or specifically my trachea and the CPAP, that continuous air, would basically cause the tongue to like move down and force some air down my trachea. That's why it's called a continuous positive airway pressure, okay? So any questions with that class? Everybody good? Thumbs up if you're good. Those in the video. Cool. Is anyone else audio getting bad static sounds? Everybody good with the audio? Okay, so there's a couple of you that are having audio issues. Okay, sorry if you guys are getting bad audio, my bad. All right, so let's talk about mouth to mask ventilation. So this is basically when you're using a, uh, using a pocket face mask, there's pictures on your textbook and how to properly utilize it. The main thing that I wanna talk about here is when you're using, 
when you're just using the pocket face mask, okay, without any oxygen supplementation, your patient's only getting 16% oxygen concentration. When you add oxygen into that, it boosts up the concentration to 50%. So pretty good deal if you, uh, if you look at that in, uh, in, the, in terms of percent of oxygen concentration. And that's also in your textbook on page 228, right? So 16% without O2 supplement, that means you haven't plugged it in with the O2 tank. And then 50%, if I, it goes up to all the way up to 50% if I plug it into an O2 tank, right? And you can use the head tilt chin lift or the jaw thrust way of using a pocket face mask, right? And then you have the bag valve mask. For the bag valve mask, you already did this in the, um, excuse me, in the lab, right? So there's different methods or there's different sizes with the bag valve mask without O2 supplement. So without you connecting that to the O2, you're only giving 50% of oxygen concentration. When you plug that into the O2 tank, it boosts up your, um, your oxygen concentration to 100%, right? So uh, the preferred method, what is the preferred method for a bag valve mask? One rescuer or two rescuer? Two. Very good, two rescuer, very good. Two rescuer is the preferred method because if you look at the pictures in your tech book, textbooks from page 230 to 231, there's two, pair, two sets of hands right there. One's providing the seal, one's squeezing, okay? But if you're by yourself or if you're working on something and your other partner's working on something, one rescuer is still fine. It's just that it's not as effective as a two rescuer because there's a, it's hard to get a seal into it, right? <clears throat> So if you're providing breaths for, a, for an adult, it's one breath every five to six seconds, right? And then for a child or infant, it's one breath every three to five seconds, right? So remember those, like, um, those numbers right there because it's going to be very important for your um, skills and your um, registry as well, okay? So any questions with that? Right. Then we have um, stoma, right? So the stoma, so those are the individuals. So for the individuals that have a surgical opening on the um, surgical opening on their throat, right? Sometimes they, you have to breathe through that one, right? So when you're doing that, you have to use a pediatric size mask, okay? You have to use a pediatric size mask for a stoma, okay? But you're still gonna ventilate according to their age. So if it's an adult, it's still one breath every five to six seconds, right? And if, um, if they're a child, it's one breath every three to five seconds. If you cannot ventilate through the stoma, one thing that you can do is seal the stoma and then breathe through their mouth and nose if that's not working. That's last resort, um, but that's what it says on your book as well, but it also makes sense. So if it's stoma is not working, then plug that in and then go the regular route of mouth and nose ventilation, okay? Right, <clears throat> so any questions with the BVM and using the pocket face mask? All right, let's move on to the FROP VD, right? So the FROP VD, flow restricted oxygen power device. Okay, I, I need you guys to know how to operate this even though we don't do it in class, but look at those bullets right there. Uh, Agent one, when trying to get a good seal with the mask over the stoma, how do you keep from pressing too hard and blocking the airway? Well, that's why we, you, you use a pediatric size mask when it comes to the stoma, because it will allow you to just basically provide that AC clamp technique to lightly put it, it on top of the patient's airway. So there's no need to be aggressive with pushing it down because you are exactly correct. It's going to cause that to depress onto the trachea. So you wanna make sure that you don't do that to your patients when you're using uh, BVM on the stoma. Does that answer your question? You're welcome. All right, so FROP VD. So let's look at those bullets right there. So features of that FROP VD. One, it provides a flow rate of 100% at 40 liters per minute. So not only is it high, it provides high liters per minute of oxygen. Two, it has an inspiratory pressure relief valve. So that means that when your patient starts breathing, it automatically, there's a release valve, okay, that, um, that works or that opens up, okay. There's an audible alarm on it, okay. There's a trigger that allows you to use both hands, right. Uh, that's why on the picture on page 235, that patient is basically, uh, I mean, the EMT is basically using that trigger device for that FROP VD, 
Okay, and it's um, basically works in both normal situation and extreme situation. So those are your features for the Frop VD. So it's really, really good. However, there's a lot of steps that goes into it. And another downfall of the Frop VD is that we cannot, okay, we cannot use it on a child or a pediatric patient unless you have certification or unless your protocol allows you to use it. Right, so again, FROP VD preferred on adults. When it comes to children, you have to have special training. So in general, not good for children, big no-no in children, and unless you have medical direction and approval or your protocol allows you to. Does that make sense, everyone? Thumbs up if you good. Cool, cool, cool. Right, last one for the ventilation, the ATV. My favorite one when I was a volunteer, uh, when I was a volunteer EMT, you know why? Because it's like, literally, it's a portable device that you just plugged um, the tubing in so you don't have to bring their big ventilators, the big bulky ventilators. So if you look at the picture, it looks like a very small one because it's easily, basically, you can easily put that into the patient and it's preferred when you're transferring a patient, let's just say somebody called you. Uh, uh, a nursing facility called your EMS unit. Hey, we need to transfer Granny Smith to the ER because she's not feeling well. Well, instead of bringing her a big ventilator from the nursing facility, you can easily connect Granny Smith to the um, automatic um, transport ventilator. So that's the main thing about it is, uh, on that ATV. It's very portable and easily used as well. And you can easily adjust settings on that uh, specific automatic, uh, automatic transport ventilator. So any questions with that one class? Any questions? Good. Why are you guys rubbing your creep, your non-existent mustache? Okay. Cool. All right. Let's move on to oxygenation. So everything we talked about is ventilation. And who do we ventilate? P patients with adequate or inadequate breathing? Inadequate. Inadequate, right? Patients with inadequate breathing. So remember our table? Those are the ones in the respiratory failure and in the respiratory arrest. We ventilate them using those devices that we just talked about, okay? Now let's move on to the last part. Yes, the last part. And I'm finally going to shut up and leave you alone because I'm taking away from y'all's precious evening, right? Okay. Heck no. No. Nope. Right. So let's talk about Ox. HM1. I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, it's okay. Hold on. Let me plug in my, let me plug in my laptop. It's about to die. Sorry. I was just saying thanks for your help, HM1. You're welcome. All right. There we go. Better this than drugs. Oh, God. You're in the military. So I don't know why you're going to, why you're even thinking of drugs, Tobias. All right. Oxygen therapy. All right. Uh, so importance of oxygen supplementation. Going back to mod one, we already talked about this. In the atmosphere, how many percent of oxygen are you intaking? Bente uno. Very good. 21%. 21% is the only amount of oxygen that you're actually able to intake in the atmosphere. So um, also there are several um, issues that we need to consider when it comes to oxygen. One, oxygen is a drug. Yes, oxygen is a drug because it, it basically treats breathing, some breathing problems. That's why it's considered a drug. So this is why okay, you need to make sure that you are delivering it properly. Whoever is talking, make sure you please mute your microphones. Two, um, oxygen can cause harm, right? So sometimes um, patients that have specific um, conditions, please mute your microphones. I'm sorry, it's hard to look for individuals that are talking because there's 50 participants. See this face? This is my what the fuck face. So mute your mic. Hashtag mute the mic. Okay. All right. So it says right here on page 237, always remember to ventilate rather than oxygenate patients in respiratory failure or respiratory arrest. Right, so not only did I mention it on that table on our chart, even the book says it. The respiratory failure, the respiratory arrest, you better start ventilating your patients, right? Okay, 
well, let's talk about the um, oxygen, uh, oxygen equipment, okay? The reason why the book mentioned that, because most students, we give, the, we give you a scenario in skills or in, you know, and we tell you that your patient is an adult and they're breathing 30 breaths per minute and you still rely on nasal cannula. What would a nasal cannula do for your patient? Nothing, right? Literally, it's like putting your patient who's about to die in front of a fan. It's not doing anything, right? Might as well just kill your patient now. Okay, so let's talk about the different types of oxygen equipment, right? So first off, we have the oxygen cylinder. Um, preferably, your oxygen cylinders are full when is at how many PSI? Very good, 2K, 2,000 PSI. So that's a full. We can keep using it until it's at 200. That's the safe residual, right? So 2,000 is the best optimal but of course, once you keep using it, that PSI keeps going down, 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 down. But once it reach, reaches 200, you better replace that, right? Because that 200 can go to zero real quick and you don't want to give empty oxygen cylinders to your patient, okay? So 2,000 PSI is the preferred one. We have different sizes, D cylinder, DEM are your small ones. The G and H are your gigantic cylinders. And it's not a bottle, okay, Johnson. It's a tank or a cylinder. Okay. Right. Let's talk about the, um, I'm not going to go over the do's and don'ts of the oxygen cylinder. It's pretty self-explanatory. Don't smoke beside an oxygen cylinder unless you want to turn into a human barbecue, feel free. But you still have patients who are so hard-headed who still smokes, right? And you can see them dragging their oxygen tank. Okay. Um, do not drag your oxygen tanks. Do not roll your oxygen tanks, right? Don't drop it. Um, don't put grease, oil, or fast baits. I don't know why they even put that here. Never use grease, oil, or fast fat bait soaps, uh, fat based soaps on your devices. Who would who needs to lube up oxygen cylinders anyway? I don't know, but it's on there because probably somebody did it and it exploded. So you know what? Let's put that on the guidelines because some knucklehead will but will probably try it. Okay, so. Press, uh, cylinder is one of the parts of the equipment. Next one, we have pressure regulator. The pressure regulator is for a safety mechanism. I'm going to say that again. Pressure regulator, keyword there, safety. Okay? So you don't want all that 2,000 PSI rushing to your patient's face. right? That's why we regulate, we regulate the pressure that goes into their face. Just imagine if you have 2,000 PSI blowing to the patient's face. It'd probably like rip apart their gums or their lips or something. So that's the job, the pressure, uh, pressure regulator, okay? The flow meter, this is the one that I'm now going to set my blah, blah, blah to 15 liters per minute. Y'all keep on calling it, uh, calling it regulator, but it's actually the flow meter that you're adjusting uh, um, to 15 liters per minute, right? So, and then you also have the humidifier. Humidifier is very time consuming, so we only use it if we do have time. Because if your patient is having a hard time breathing, we don't have time to say like, hey, you know what, Granny Smith, I know you're like breathing at 28 breaths per minute, but I think you would appreciate this humidified oxygen. No, no, I don't. I want to breathe. Ventilate me right now. That's what Granny Smith is telling you. Okay. Okay. So those are there are several parts of equipment, cylinder, humidifier, pressure regulator, and um, flow meter. Okay. So hazards of oxygen therapy. Just like everything else, there is a hazard, there's a risk to it, but please do not let this stop you from get using it. So first off, it can cause um, oxygen toxicity or air sac collapse. So individuals that, uh, individuals that are, um, these are common with patients that are, have sensitivity when you overload their lungs with oxygen. So it's almost like those that are used to, uh, patients with COPD. Patients with COPD are so used to um, patients with COPD are so used to um, carbon dioxide levels in their body. So when you overload them with oxygen, it tends to not mesh so well with the body. So that's why they mentioned oxygen toxicity or air collapse. And sometimes uh, if you rush the body with too much oxygen, it could cause the air sacs to collapse. Again, this is a very, very rare occasion. Okay, that happens in a pre-hospital setting. So don't be afraid of like, ooh, I don't know if the air sacs are going to collapse on my patients. I'm not going to give them oxygen. That is a wrong way of thinking. On, okay. Um, 
then you have the infant eye damage. So this is why we're very, this is why another reason why we don't use the FROP VD, because the FROP VD gives 100% oxygen concentration at 40 liters per minute. So if there's a leak on the mask seal and it goes to the infant's eyes, it could damage their, um, it can damage their eyes specifically and can cause some scar on the retina. So that's why we're very cautious of using that one, right? So those are the, um, hazards, right, or the clinical indications or the clinical hazards of using um, oxygen. However, if your patient is having a hard time breathing, such as respiratory distress, respiratory failure, or respiratory arrest, do not, do not hesitate in providing oxygen to your patients, right? Because before, um, around two th early, early 90s, early 2000s, EMTs were taught, hey, don't give oxygen to patients with COPD. But they learned that, you know, it's not going to kill a patient in a, in a pre-hospital setting to give oxygen, right? So that oxygen will actually help them a lot more, okay? So any questions for that class? Okay, good. Let's move on to um, setting up the O2 tank. So you guys remember this? Just, rem uh, just, remember, your, um, just remember your, what do you call this? your lab steps, right? So I'm going to grab my oxygen tank. You're going to turn it on to get rid of dust and debris. Okay, you're going to turn it back off. And then you're going to put your pressure regulator using the what system? Y'all were messing this up on the lab earlier. Pin index system. Very good. The pin index system. That's how you're going to attach that pressure regulator using the pin index system. And then you're going to turn it on again to check for leaks and to check for, to make sure that it's at 2,000 PSI. So that's how you're gonna insert it. And then you're gonna pick what oxygenation device or oxygen delivery device that you're gonna use, which we're about to talk about. And this is the last part that I'm gonna talk about on this one, right? So we, there's several de uh, oxygen delivery devices. Everybody flip your book to page 247, right? Page 247, everybody. Grab your books, 247. Right, so on page 247, let's look at that one by one. Non-rebreather mask, okay? Non-rebreather mask delivers your flow of oxygen to 12 to 15 liters per minute. The concentration of it is about 80 to 100%, right? So what's so special about the non-rebreather mask? Well, what's special about this is the air that I exhale doesn't come back in. That's why it's called non-rebreather. I'm not gonna able to breathe in the air again that I exhaled. So non-rebreather 12 to 15 80 to 90 percent next the nasal cannula nasal cannula i know your textbook says one to six but it's actually four to six liters per minute right four to six liters per minute is the flow rate and oxygen concentration is 24 to 44 right 24 to 44 percent um, what's so special about um, nasal cannulas? Well, this is for individuals that can't tolerate your not NRB, specifically common with pediatric patients or those that have like, oh, I don't like the feeling of the mask on my face. So nasal cannula will probably be appropriate for them, okay? Or those that only need small amounts of oxygen. So for example, they called you, they're talking fine, early signs of respiratory distress, they can still talk to you. Then Nasal cannula would probably be the less aggressive treatment, and then I would go to the non-rebreather mask next if I need to, right? Then you have the partial rebreather mask, 9 to 10 liters per minute. It's about 46, 4 to 60% oxygen uh, concentration. What's so special about the partial rebreather mask? Well, what's so special about it is that it allows um, some of the exhaled air to mix in with the oxygen um, concentration that the patient is receiving, right? So that's the partial rebreather mask, okay? And then you have your Venturi mask. The Venturi mask, you can give up to about 15 liters per minute. The oxygen concentrations is only 40, uh, 24 to 60%. What's so special about this, it's the opposite of a partial rebreather mask. This time it mixes this with the oxygen that I inhale. Mm. Okay, very good question, Jubert. So in the chat box, it says, HM1, in class where we're always told to start, um, always start with a nasal cannula. And if that didn't work, go to NRB. That is actually a true statement. However, in the chapter 10 test, there was a question about what we should do for a man with SPO2 
of 93% or around there. So I chose nasal cannula and the answer was NRB. So should we or should we not always start with a nasal cannula? I'm going to tell you right now, practice common practice out in the field and in your national registry, specifically for my Air Force, you start with a non-aggressive treatment, which is a nasal cannula at 46 liters per minute. This specific book, however, um, tells you to go with the non-rebreather and only use the nasal cannula if your patient doesn't tolerate it, okay? But I want you all to stick with the starting with the nasal cannula first. And if it ever shows up on the test, on the mod test, where everybody picked nasal cannula and then the correct answer was NRB, we usually give that question back to y'all anyway, right? Because what we want to do is for you guys to be, hey, what do we actually do out in the field and what is it a national registry? Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, good to go, All right? So is that clear? Does that answer your question, Jubert? Hubert? Yes, no, maybe. Can I get a reply? Our response. Should ask a question. Okay. Ask a question. Of me, you ask him. I don't know what she's asking. What is it, Mesa? Stop wasting my time. What is it? So HM1, they're fighting over here if we will choose nasal cannula or NRB on the test. But according to the book, we'll follow the book, right? The NRB. But if mostly people choose NC, then we will go, you will give us back the question. Yes, that's exactly what I said. So even if the test gave you um, NRB, and since we've been teaching you in class, both Alpha and Bravo, to start with nasal cannula, if ever that comes up, because we've been, we requested to get that question taken out of the test anyway. So, but if ever you do see it, we'll make sure that we give you guys back the points sense good perfect right so those are your different ox oxygen supplementation device i would specifically remember those specific the first two because they're your they're the most commonly used ones anytime you see a most common used item it's probably a good thing to remember because it's going to be important for skills and registry such as non-rebreather and um, nasal cannula right and then last but not the least, you have your tracheostomy mask. Tracheostomy mask is those for those individuals that have a stoma, right? So tracheostomy mask, um, depending on, uh, it varies and depending on the manufacturer of how much flow meter, of how much liters per minute and how much oxygen concentration because it varies from um, every manufacturer over there, okay? Right. So special considerations, it's the same special considerations that we talked about in chapter nine, so I'm not gonna go over that again. However, if you look on page 251, underneath pediatric notes, everybody, if you look at that one, it says right there, under management considerations, when ventilating, avoid excessive pressure and volume. Two, use properly sized face mask when providing ventilations. Um, three, flow-restricted oxygen-powered devices are contraindicated, should not be used in infants unless you have a certification. And last but not least, infants and children are prone to gastric distension, which may impair their adequate ventilations. This is why you want to make sure that you're only giving breaths to pediatric patients until you vis see visible chest rise, okay? And then for the advanced airway, the only thing that I want to say to this one can we as EMTs, okay, can we as EMTs insert advanced airway devices? Can we do that? No, right? We cannot insert advanced airway devices to, um, to, uh, to our patients. Only advanced EMTs and paramedics can do that. So, however, you're going to be assisting on this one. So the main things that you can do as an EMT is to basically pre-oxygenate your patient. Basically give as much oxygen as you can because um, take, inserting that advanced airway device involves a lot of hands-on time. So I'm going to have to stop oxygenating my patient for a while. So it, it's probably best to give them, that's why the term called hyper-oxygenate or give the patient extra oxygen before they get started intubating, right? So we have two kinds of um, airway devices. One is called visual. That's the one where you can see on page 253, I can see the vocal cords, I'm looking at it, okay, and then I'm in, the doctor is gonna insert it under, uh, under vocal cords, okay, through their vocal cords. And then the other one is called blind insertion. This is very common out in the combat zone, actually. Um, 
uh, quick uh, experience that I have. That's every corpsman in the, in, the, in the field that I send out. I make sure that they have a blind airway device, such as a King LT tube or the laryngeal airway mask, because in the field, I don't have time to look for it. I'm just going to go ahead and hopefully 50-50 chance insert it there, and it would cover it. Um, and it would cover that one so that the patient doesn't aspirate on it, right? So those are the different types of airway devices. Like I said, your main thing as an EMT is to assist your patient, okay? Does that make sense, everyone? Okay, and that's basically the end of chapter nine and chapter 10, right? Are there any questions so far? Questions, comments, concerns, right? Did this help out? Did I just confuse, did I confuse you more? If the blind ventilation doesn't work the first time, do you just pull out and try again? Yes, pretty much, because the blind insertion, it's a 50-50 chance. So I've had experience where the blind insertion device didn't successfully, because it's, it's not a guarantee that it's going to um, uh, work properly, but that's why it involves training. Okay. Anybody else has any questions? Agent one. Yes. The, um, we, we learned that the epiglottis uh, separates the upper and lower um, airway, but then also in the book, it says that the vera, whatever it's called, the really long one, separates it. The laryngopharynx? Are you talking about the laryngopharynx? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that divides it. Yes. So here's the best way I can explain this. Okay. So the epiglottis is the one that covers the trachea. Yes. Okay. So your lower, your upper airway ends in the larynx. Okay. Anything below the larynx is considered lower airway. So the epiglottis is right above the trachea. Right. So that's, that's why it's called the, it's the division, right? Cause it's right by the larynx and it's also right above the trachea. So that's why it's like that division right there. And it's also on the laryngeal. It's also where the laryngopharynx is because the laryngopharynx is basically the last, the last part of the pharynx before it enters the lower airway. Does that answer your question? Yes. No, maybe. Oh, you just leave me up in the air hanging dry. Good to go. Okay. HM1, can we use BVN and tracheostomy mask for stoma patients? Yes. Um, trache but, however, BVM is for those individuals that are not breathing on their own, right? So um, BVM is for those individuals that are not breathing on their own. Tracheostomy mask is an oxygenation device. Remember that, okay? BVM not breathing on their own, inadequate breathing, tracheostomy mask, there's still somewhat of an adequate breathing, so I'm just going to use that one. So think of it as the tracheostomy mask is like the NRB for the stoma, okay? Any more questions? Good. Right, so if you guys don't have any more questions... Uh, will I get arrested for doing oxygen since it's a drug? No, actually, you're not going to get arrested. However, if you ask that question again, you're going to get hit with an oxygen cylinder on your forehead, and I'm going to get arrested because you're asking stupid questions like that. And that is not a threat because threats are not allowed. It's a promise. Any more valid questions? No, nada? Okay. Everybody, this help out? Am I, or am I just, did I just waste y'all's time right here? It helps. Okay, so here's the deal. If I get bad results tomorrow, this is not going to happen again, okay? Because we, we spent so many after hours time. I expect you guys are putting in the effort. So please give, give us good results. Let's make it a happy Friday tomorrow. Please, let's have zero test failures tomorrow, okay? Zero test failures. That is our main goal, to have a happy, happy Friday, okay? Thank you, HM1. Other than that, you are welcome. You can start logging off if you don't have any questions for me. Happy Friday Eve. And um, if you are going to study, don't stay up too late, right? 2300 at the latest. HM1, are you PTing with us tomorrow?